So, how should we think about Dan and people like him? Should we, like Delia, see their crimes as emanating from who they are, what happened as a product of their character or personality? Really, this is a question for all of us. When we tell stories of lives, criminal lives, or even successful ones, the legendary businessman, the beloved teacher, usually at the center of the story is a personality, a set of consistent characteristics fundamental to them and the same over the many situations that they pass through that's seen as primarily responsible for whatever happened. Personality is how people usually explain things. And for a long time, it was how many psychologists explained things, too. And then came a man named Walter Mischel, who helped transform the way that psychology thinks about what makes us, us. I was considered the devil killing the field, trying to destroy the very concept of personality. You see, in 1968, Walter Mischel, the man that you just heard, wrote a book that challenged some of the most basic ideas that we have about the role that personality plays in our lives. You probably don't know the book. It has the extremely unsplashy title, Personality and Assessment. But you probably do know something about Walter Mischel because he is the man behind one of America's favorite experiments. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow for you. This is a reenactment we found on YouTube of Michelle's famous marshmallow test. You sit a kid in a room in front of a delicious marshmallow. It smells yummy. Tell them that you're going to leave the room, and if they can delay their gratification and not eat the marshmallow until you come back, they'll get two marshmallows instead of one. Stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. A small test seen as having huge implications. The kids who successfully delayed gratification at this age do much better later in life. This is from a CBS report. They make more money. They are happier. They have better relationships, and they're less likely to get into trouble. Basically, over the last two decades, the marshmallow test has become a kind of poster child for the idea that there are specific personality traits that we all have inside of us that are stable and consistent and will determine our lives far into the future. There is only one tiny problem with this interpretation, as Walter Michel himself will tell you. That iconic story is upside down wrong, that your future is in a marshmallow, because it isn't. So I promise that later I will explain exactly what is wrong with how the marshmallow test is usually portrayed. But to get the full force of how ironic it is that Michelle's marshmallow test has taken on the cultural meaning that it has, you really have to go back to 1961 when Michelle was a professor at Harvard University and got assigned to teach a course on personality. So realizing I had to teach this stuff, I decided to look at the literature, and I found myself enormously puzzled. See, Michelle, like pretty much every psychologist at the time, had a bunch of basic assumptions about personality. The first was that people did have different personalities and that those different personalities could be defined by looking at their traits. Traits like you heard at the beginning of the show. Quiet, introverted. Outspoken. Aggressive. There are all kinds of traits. Sensitive. And at the time, personality researchers liked to argue over which were most important. But the thing they almost never argued about was the other major assumption of the field at the time, which is that whatever traits you had were stable over time and consistent across different situations. For example, a friendly person is someone who should be friendly over time. So if he's friendly at 20, he should be friendly at 25. And if he's friendly, he should be essentially friendly across most situations in which friendliness is a reasonable and accepted way, possible way of being. So an honest person is an honest person and a dishonest person is a dishonest person? Exactly. And a criminal is a criminal across many situations and will remain that way. Which is why Walter Michel was so puzzled when he sat down to do his literature review. All the studies that I were reading, when they were looking for the consistency across situations, weren't finding it. Consider, for example, this enormous study done on honesty in children. 
The researchers, Hartshorn and May, had put thousands of kids in experimental situations in a wide variety of settings, had actually given the children opportunities to cheat or lie at school, at home. And it came out with results that were shocking at the time, which is that the same child who cheats, for example, in the arithmetic class could be a fantastic student, no cheating and so on, in another class. They were not consistently anything. They were inconsistent in their honesty. And that was the shocking result, essentially, of the Hartshorn and May study, which essentially got buried. A pattern Michelle found in other studies, too. Whenever personality research found inconsistency, it was dismissed. Maybe our measures weren't right. And what I began to wonder about as I was reviewing this vast literature was maybe our assumptions aren't right. Maybe we're not thinking right about who we are and what we can be. And so Walter Michelle wrote his book, 365 pages of tables and charts, which argued that one of our most basic beliefs about personality, that our personalities are consistent, made up of traits that determine our behavior no matter where we go or what we do, that idea might just be a mirage. that we think of as consistent and make us us. But you just told us about this research that shows our personalities are way less consistent than we think. Yeah, so the question is, why do they seem so consistent? Why, why does my mom always seem to act exactly like my mom? Well, you're actually asking a question that turns out to be pretty deep. This is Lee Ross, a famous Stanford psychologist who read Walter Michel's book about personality in the 1960s and immediately understood the profound puzzle that it presented. Why do we believe there's so much consistency? Why do we so much believe in personality and use the idea of personality to explain behavior if, in fact, there isn't very much consistency? Psychologists came up with all kinds of theories. Some argued that consistency is an illusion. We simply don't see behaviors that don't conform to our notion of a person's personality. But Ross had a different idea. What I said is, oh, they are seeing real consistency, but they're getting the reason for it wrong. We see consistency in everyday life because of the power of the situation. See, Ross believes that the real thing that determines your behavior isn't the stuff sitting inside of you, your personality. It's all the stuff around you, your situation. Take, for example, this situation. Now, what I'm going to do is strap down your arms to avoid any excessive movement on your part during the experiment. This is a recording of the infamous obedience study done by Stanley Milgram, You've probably heard of it. It's the study where nice, everyday people administered what they thought were real electrical shocks to completely innocent strangers because they were put in a situation which required them to do it. This one will be 195 volts. Ah! Let me out of here! Let me out of here! The Milgram experiment was actually one of a bunch of studies done in the 60s and 70s, which all had a similar theme. The idea was that by manipulating situations, you can change what people do for good or for ill because situations determine how we behave, not character. That's true. This will be 345. Which brings us back to this question of consistency and why the personalities of the people around us often seem so consistent. The theory proposed by Lee Ross was that we see consistency not because of this thing inside people, their personality, but because people are usually embedded in stable situations. Because the circumstances that are influencing their behavior remain consistent. That is, we exist inside jobs and families that hold us in place. Sometimes the specific dynamics of those jobs and families ask us to be the same kind of person at work and at home, pastor at work, kind of father at home. Sometimes the dynamics at work and home ask us to be different, gangster at work, kind of father at home. 
The point is that ultimately it's the situation, not the person, that determines things. People are predictable, but they're predictable because we see them in situations where their behavior is constrained by that situation and by the roles they're occupying and the relationship they have with us. Huh. But even though the power of situations was big scientific news for a while, Ross says the studies never changed how people actually thought. Oh, no, certainly not. I don't think... I don't think it changed. I don't even think it changes very much for most psychologists. It's a very, very powerful bias, this tendency, at least in our culture, to keep feeling that ultimately people's behavior is a reflection of who they are. And it's no wonder, as Walter Michel told me, that we're drawn to this idea that personality is important and stable. It makes us feel better. I mean, how can you marry anybody unless you believe that they're essentially going to be like you've got them pictured now? We like to feel that we're living in a stable world. It's, I think the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn about its instability. Uh, the, the more we learn about any science, the more we learn about its endless complexity. When it comes to human beings, we really don't have tolerance for realizing that there is an enormous amount of complexity. Jason Bunting has worked at Marion his entire professional career, around 20 years, which is to say that he has had a lot of experience with prisoners, but also a lot of experience talking to people on the outside about the men behind his prison walls. And he says that people are always coming up to him and saying things that make clear that they believe a criminal is a criminal. Always. The community thinks about people that are incarcerated as criminal. An inmate will always be manipulative. An inmate will always be uh, mean and angry. And those things never change. In fact, he says this belief is so ingrained that it appears in our language without us even realizing it. Then he points out my own first question to him after we met this guy who used to be incarcerated at Marion, but was now a free man who had just come to Jason's office to see him. What was your first question to me? What did he do? That's for your first response. Formerly incarcerated, you're, you did it. What did he do? Who cares what he did? Who cares? That question itself, Jason said, assumes on a basic level that the man is who he was not who he is today. And that makes Jason bristle because Jason believes that people are genuinely capable of change, which doesn't mean that Jason has never been burned by that belief. He's been burned badly. Just this year, a former prisoner, a rapist who had transformed himself into such a model prisoner that after he was released from Marion, Jason actually went out of his way to hire the man back to do rehabilitation work with the other prisoners. That man betrayed Jason terribly. The guy, who Jason considered a friend, was arrested for running drugs in the prison. And that wasn't the first time Jason was disappointed. But when he looks over the course of his experience, he still holds that belief. Then he told me about this other guy who used to be at Marion. A man that was incarcerated for 20 years, my age, is, has what you would consider and the public would consider a hideous crime, a sex offense that he committed when he was 18. It's hideous. Jason says he knew the man for years in prison, and now he's known the man for years out of prison. The man's been free for about seven. And Jason has watched him become a profoundly different person. Has a beautiful young daughter, a beautiful wife, a home, stable job. He's a changed man. So is Jason naive? Not according to Walter Michelle. Maybe we're not thinking right about who we are and what we can be. That's Michelle again, who told me that to truly understand how people change, you actually have to consider a third way of looking at all of this and think about the role played by the brain. The source is this thing up here that's called your mind and your brain. And stay with me here for a second because... What Michelle does, I think, gives a broader view that shows how personality and situation all fit together. 
So to explain it to me, Michelle drew a small diagram on the blackboard behind his desk. I'm, I'm going to go to a... Yeah, okay. Uh, can I come with you? Yeah, of course. On the board, Michelle drew three circles. The first represented personality, your traits, your temperament. Then he drew a second circle. Here are the situations, okay? But in between the two, Michelle drew a third circle. This, he said, poking the board, is your mind. That wonderful, curious thing that houses all kinds of invisible stuff. Like your expectations, your stable expectations of, about what happens if you do certain things. It has in it your way of construing or seeing or framing or depicting different situations. So when I'm in a large group, do I feel terrified or because it's a scary situation? Or when I'm in a large group, do I see it as a challenge because he is an opportunity to really reach a lot of people? All this stuff in your mind, these beliefs, assumptions, expectations that you've gotten from your friends, your family, your culture, those things, Michelle explained, are the filter through which you see the world. Your mind stands between who you are, your personality, and whatever situation you're in, and profoundly influences how your brain interprets the world around it. Those beliefs, expectations, assumptions, they direct what your mind pays attention to, quite literally, even what it physically sees in a situation, and how it feels about what it sees. And so when the stuff inside the mind changes, people change. They begin to interpret their situations differently or themselves differently. And so situations act on them differently. People can use their wonderful brains to think differently about situations, to reframe them, to reconstrue them, to even reconstrue themselves. This is why Michelle sees people as fundamentally flexible. He tells me that is the single most important thing that he has stood for in his whole professional life. What my life has been about is in showing the potential for human beings to not be the victims of their biographies. Uh, not their biological biographies, not their social biographies. Uh, and to show in great detail the many ways in which people can change what they become and how they think. Which brings us back, finally, to the marshmallow the test. Marshmallow, for you. you can either wait, Literally, the I'll point the wait, of the original marshmallow now. study was to demonstrate how flexible people are, how easily changed if they simply reinterpret the way that they frame the situation around them. For example, the situation of being exposed to a delicious, tempting marshmallow. The same little girl who can't wait for even a half minute for two little Oreo cookies, if she tries it and I tell her ahead of time, you can make believe that they're not really there. It's just a picture in your head. The same child waits 15 minutes. It's a very small change that's been made in how the child is representing the object. Is it real or is it a picture? And by changing the representation, you dramatically change her behavior on a measure as serious as the, as the marshmallow test. The vast majority of the kids that Michelle studied were able to delay gratification after they reframed their interpretation of the situation in front of them. Though, of course, that's not the moral that our culture drew. It's your destiny. Your future is in a marshmallow. And it's far from your destiny. 